Time to get my co-host into position. Voila, Kajimish. We're gonna go. Kajimish is back. He's passed his probationary period, and we're at, we're thrilled to have him back on the show. Please give him a warm welcome. He's been upgraded to the uh, storage supply box. I've also there's this new doodad shindig thingamabob to introduce you to some American vocabulary. I don't know what it's doing, but I love it because it makes me look like I know what I am doing. It's a new haircut. We've got blue mascara. We've got new earrings. You know what that means? It's time for a new show. Welcome to season two, episode. Two. Two. Last week we had a bit of an interlude with our first ever uh, chaos cut. Today I wanted to talk about something that has been on my mind more so recently, but which upon further investigation I realized has always been on my mind, and 30 minutes is not sufficient enough to cover it, but hopefully this will start a conversation about something I suspect many of uh, our listeners will relate to. In this episode I wanted to talk about food. And again, 30 minutes is not going to be enough to cover it, but I want to talk about food within the context of being a student at the University of Oxford and just some of the ways in which the specter of eating, as it were, um, shapes life here, not just in a purely physiological way or an nutritional way, but also socially and how all of these different spheres of life intersect. Because the fact of the matter is that a lot of um, life in Oxford revolves around eating and drinking and a lot of socializing and the ability to form friends to feel like you're part of a community does happen around food whether or not we're conscious of it but there's sort of the, the old principle that if you want college students to do anything you offer them free food the phrasing what's wrong with you takes a different turn um, there's a sort of medical aspect when it comes to food of well what's wrong with you that you can't eat this or something bothering you but also within a social context of what's wrong with you that you're not drinking or that you're sort of just standing there and not uh, engaging with the food items um, that have been put out. Um, how do we move away from that to thinking about how do we make somebody comfortable rather than making them feel like they're being left out or that they're somehow strange for not wanting to do a particular course of action. Um, and especially a course of action that's seen as necessary for being included within something. At the risk of sounding like a social scientist, what I wanted to do in this episode was draw attention to this phenomenon of food, if you will, um, in a place like Oxford as something that is not a neutral object or a neutral process, but rather a mediating force for a lot of different kinds of ways in which we can see one another. So class, um, self-care, socialization, things like that, and that we can take steps to be more conscious in the way in which we talk about food with one another, particularly in a context where coming from so many different backgrounds, there are different understandings of what food is and how it's used to connect people to one another. And being aware of the fact that often dietary issues whether it's allergies or eating disorders, are not things that are immediately present. And we can take more care to be sensitive to the fact that eating, especially in a world where we have a better understanding of why someone may have restrictive eating patterns or why someone may choose to be vegan, we can be more sensitive to the fact that Choices are made when we approach food that we don't always see, even with people that we know quite well. And to find ways in which something that can often be divisive, even without us noticing, can we find ways in which it is not a necessary link for people to feel included in their communities, where it's more of an opt-in, where it's more of a auxiliary or sort of supporting force rather than you have to come, you have to eat, you have to engage in some kind of nutritional process in order to buy into whatever this is, whether it's your college or a society or any other kind of social environment. A lot of the ways in which we become ingratiated into a community are via consumption of some kind. And there's different levels to this, right? Because you have on the one hand, uh, nibbles to formals to outings with a club or in my case you know often with my scholarship program but there's also um, the question of alcohol um, 
many of these events, both academic and extracurricular, in one's college, in one's uh, societies, revolve around alcohol. What I do appreciate very much about, you know, studying in England is that there are many, um, what is it, NABs, non-alcoholic beverages, um, like elderflower, which we don't have in the United States, and that, that's very much a part of the um, drinking and socializing culture within Oxford. But I want to talk today specifically about food and what that experience has been like for me as somebody who has um, had a relationship with food that's revolved in the first instance around allergies and managing allergies, both for myself and within a socialized context, but also figuring out what kinds of foods make me unhappy and finding ways of managing a healthy diet alongside academic and professional work. I say that as though I have figured it out, I haven't, and I suspect this show for me is a way of trying to work through some of that thinking and some of those experiences. One of my earliest memories of Oxford was coming to Maudlin College as an MST candidate, and we had our first formal of the year for new students. And I had something of a breakdown beforehand because I realized I hadn't really alerted the college to my allergies which was entirely my fault. And then I started to think, all right, well, the way the arrangement of the hall is, is that you're sort of stuck into these long benches, and God forbid I should have an allergic reaction, I have to sort of wiggle myself out of the bench. Everyone's going to see that somebody's wiggling themselves out of a bench and running out of the hall, and I'm going to be trying to stab myself with an EpiPen. And in that way, allergies aren't just this response your body has, but they are also a social and socialized experience. And it's silly to say that one might be embarrassed about having allergies. It's a moment of immense vulnerability. Um, you're put in this position of people worrying about you, which is lovely, but you're also like, I just let me stab myself with my tiny needle and get adrenaline into my body. And I had a total meltdown before him because I thought, what if something happens? And perhaps it speaks to the nature of how allergies are handled in these sort of group contexts, then my first worry was, how are people going to perceive this? Because it adds an, it's an additional layer of pressure and worry. Because at least in my experience, and I can't speak for others who have similar allergies, it's sort of like you want to slink away and just handle it on your own without having to also account for other people's freaking out. In my experience with allergies, people who don't have them or people who stand outside of it, you know, very sympathetic bystanders and helpers, they freak out often more than I do, maybe because I'm used to it. So this experience, you know, I was very fortunate that Maudlin handled my allergy on very short notice. I remember going up to the senior tutor like maybe an hour and half an hour before the formal started going, by the way, I have a life-threatening allergy. Is there anything we can do about it? And he had um, one of these little yellow sticky notes that they gave to me. And I've, since then, I've kept my sticky notes whenever I go to a formal and it says, no nuts, I, I've seen no shellfish for other people, no dairy, so on and so forth. It's something I'd never had before. So it was very exciting that they put it in this very formal uh, place setting, you have your tiny little yellow sticky note that tells the um, servers, please don't give this person something that will send them to their maker. Moral of the story is do let your college know something's wrong. I suspect this is probably obvious to everyone, but it, the deeper story here is the fact that my first experiences of Oxford within a college context were very much mediated through the lens of what happens if I can't control the food that I'm eating. There's a current that runs through the sort of discussion about food in a place like Oxford and that we're all coming from different places and there are sort of culture clashes as well in, in different ways that people understand eating. Something I've come to realize is that food as a social language is different for different people and it's quite easy to stumble into something that for you is a way of showing affection to another person whereas for them it might be quite not even offensive but a bit triggering even or it may elicit certain anxieties around food. Um, I had a conversation with a friend about the culture that she comes from where sort of feeding people beyond the point of which they're comfortable as you know sort of pushing food on them is a is a big issue and it's seen as a way of taking care of someone but if you're already struggling with um, dietary concerns or you're still trying to moderate what you eat or you haven't quite figured out what your limits are it can be an element of pressure as well right because you don't want to offend the other person and this is something I've run into often is how do I communicate to people who come from a different background to mine or even just like within the United Kingdom or 
in contexts where, for example, alcohol is an important social lubricant, how do I communicate my concerns without feeling like I'm, without worrying that I'm offending the host? And this is a question I've often posed to people when I've, you know, visited them in their home country. It's how do I let your parents know I can't really eat that kind of food or certain kinds of things give me the ick or I actually am not really comfortable drinking. And I'm lucky that many responses are quite positive, people won't be, feel offended, they actually want to know, they want you to feel comfortable. And in other situations, it's been like a, wait, why did you say that this person is doing something nice for you? One of the cardinal rules I have is that you don't comment on what people are eating. And I, I encounter this quite a lot in different contexts, not just in Oxford, but in different academic contexts, where people say, oh gosh, that's a lot of food you've got there. Oh gosh, you've got a lot of carbs on your plate. Why aren't you eating enough? Why aren't you doing this and that? And the motivations for saying these things are numerous. Maybe people are coming from a place of concern. Maybe they have their own insecurities about their eating. But I do think there's just a fundamental rule that you don't know what someone's eating patterns are. You don't know what they're dealing with. And it's not really your place to comment. So I sort of follow the rule of, if you are eating in someone else's company and if they're eating in yours, just say something nice. Say bon appetit. Like, and if you're genuinely concerned about someone, maybe if you're worried that they have some sort of restrictive eating patterns, to some extent it's not our business. But if you are genuinely concerned, for a friend, for example, it's not something perhaps to say in the company or in front of others, because that can just give them additional anxiety. And if you truly do believe there's an issue, not making it a public spectacle would be the natural thing to do. And pulling them aside, saying, hey, I just noticed a couple of things. Don't want to put any pressure on you, but if you ever want to talk, here's what I've noticed. Hope everything's okay. There's also a way in which food in becomes a lens through which people discuss class or through which people come to recognize certain class distinctions. And in a place like England, where class remains a very topical conversation and a way of interacting with people. It's been interesting to see the ways in which food plays into that as well. So I've noticed watching friends interact and saying, how could you not know that this kind of dish exists? Or somebody saying, well, I, I grew up without access to these kinds of foods, or I've just never experienced them outside of my home culture. And there is often, even if we don't notice it, there's maybe an element of judgment, like, why don't you want to try this? Or surely you will appreciate caviar, for example, and I think it's, then food becomes less of an enjoyable thing, less a process of discovery and enrichment and nourishment in the literal and metaphorical sense, and one in which we begin to draw divisions between one another. Uh, as coming from the United States, there's always these comments about, oh, Americans eat so much, or Americans don't eat in a balanced way, or things like that, and it, it always makes me think, it's none of your business, A, B, what is the value of commenting on how somebody else eats by virtue of their culture? Like, it's not a productive way of engaging with me. It makes me self-conscious. And also, yes, maybe I was raised to eat in bigger portions than someone else. But then again, eating is a very individualized experience. And to make fun of somebody for cultural reasons, and it's not to say I can't take a joke about it, but I think it can... What we do when we judge people through food is that we are speaking to them in a place of vulnerability, even if they don't have issues around food. They don't dietary restrictions, they don't think twice about what they're eating, they're just happy to eat and they move on. It's a natural process for them. But you add this layer of, how should I say, um, surveillance and sort of, you have to now think twice about it. And it's just, it's not pleasant. And I think there's something we can say about how do we talk to people about food in a way that's affirming, that allows for conversations about restrictive or unhealthy behaviors without putting people in a place where they're now self-conscious about what they eat? I've often thought, like, I find it... I'm very self-conscious when I eat in front of other people, not just because of the comments they make, but I'm just very self-conscious for a number of reasons. And I've often thought if I was taken out on a date, like, could we do anything? that was not going to revolve around food. Because again, for me, I start to worry about my allergies, I worry what the other person is thinking. And then of course, if you're in a position where you have to almost perform, for example, on a date or at a college formal, or if you're socializing with people, food is an added layer of complication because you don't want to get messy, for example, and you don't want people to think, oh, 
why are they doing X, Y, and Z? So can we move from a place where food is not the thing that brings people together, but more of like a social lubricant or an opt-in so that people do not feel excluded? In Oxford, food has a very particular landscape. So you have dining halls, um, and of course people encounter issues there, for example, with religious restrictions. There's only a limited amount of restaurants here. People are exploring all kinds of different diets, and I think we have a responsibility to each other to make sure that food is not another thing people have to worry about. I recently saw on Oxfest, of all places, somebody saying, when you're trashing, so when you're celebrating the end of your exams, don't do so with food because it's disrespectful to those who aren't able to afford a proper meal or who don't know what they're going to be eating for their next meal. And again, food then becomes this distinction with um, class, things like that. I've also noticed that people just, there's a lot of anxiety around it for different reasons. And I wonder to what extent Oxford can, as a culture, start thinking about ways of socializing people, integrating them into communities in such a way that does not rely on food to be at the center of it. Um, I don't know what that looks like. When it comes to alcohol, and I think, you know, this could probably form an episode of its own, something I've struggled with in the academic fields where I was engaged is it was a very sort of obvious way for people to engage with one another. And I saw quite, without wanting to sound derogatory or judgmental, like people very consciously drinking alcohol, making fun of the fact that they were drinking as a way of connecting with one another. Whether or not it spoke to something deeper, I can't, you know, attest to that. But it made me feel as though I had to engage in it as well in order to participate in these kinds of conversations. And it wasn't until speaking to a senior academic that said, like, nobody's going to care if you do or not. There's, there's really no pressure for you to which I appreciated hearing from someone like him. But it does remain quite an important part of Oxford culture. I remember before coming here, someone said, you're going to see undergrads plastered all over the place. Uh, plastered quite literally. I, I have yet to see it probably because I don't stay out late enough. But there is even that perception, and to what extent that's a self-fulfilling prophecy, I don't know. But it seems to me that it, there's quite a conscious effort that has to go into saying, well, no, I don't want to drink. And in my case, I often worry that people might be taken aback or think you don't want to participate in this because there's so many subconscious perceptions about what alcohol can do to bring people together. I'm sure I'm probably overthinking this. I'm also quite sure that I'm not the only one who's gone through these thought processes of how do I opt out of this while still remaining a part of that culture. And I'm grateful that in England you do have a rather strong non-alcoholic beverage selection, NABs um, or NBOCs. I don't, I'm confused with BNOC, big name on campus, um, which I did not experience in the United States. Then again, I wasn't engaging in drinking culture in undergrad. And so then there's a question of, again, how does that become an opt-in situation rather than the natural social lubrication? And to what extent is it used as a way of tackling social anxieties that could be engaged with in a more productive way. This is not to say that if you drink to deal with social anxiety that that's somehow bad in and of itself, but to what extent are we masking when we do drink um, for things that we should probably be talking about because we want to feel included, for example, or we want to show that we can engage at that same level. I find it very difficult to resist, not even peer pressure, because nobody's ever said to me, you absolutely must do this, but to resist the social draw of wanting to fit in, of wanting to hold a glass of wine and feel like you're sophisticated and, you know, acculturated as everyone else. Something I've often thought about is it would be really helpful if they served non-alcoholic drinks in the same classes, because it's always obvious that you're the one drinking orange juice, because they, they give you the regular glass and not the fancy one. And I know that sounds weird, but it speaks to that fact of how do you feel included um, in a place where often it seems like there's much fancier people than you or people who have an appreciation for these things and can as, as such talk to one another about it. I do start to sound a bit like the redneck American here who have felt left out of the whole acculturation process. But the point I want to make is that much of the socializing process in Oxford, much of the 
gateways into building relationships with other people, networking, looking for jobs, you know, rising up in a club or an uh, enterprise that you're interested in. The mechanisms there are dietary, whether it's food, whether it's alcohol. And we can probably take more steps to understand the ways in which this is problematic, the ways in which these can trigger people's anxieties or underlying conditions, the ways in which it complicates life for people like me who have dietary restrictions. It's the last thing I want to think about when I go to a social event is, will there be anything for me to eat? And if it is, are there nuts? Do I have to go talk to someone? This is not to say that they have to be excluded. If anything, it's really helpful to have something to hold in your hand, something to nibble on while you're talking to someone. But the issue becomes when engagement with that is almost necessary for continuing within that context. Um, so how do we begin to reframe that? And I think that really begins with a discussion about what does it mean to eat in social context? Um, what is it like for people to deal with food in a place where they might be new. Um, as much as I've effectively ranted today about um, these issues, I do want to end on a note of gratitude for the many ways in which I have been supported within my own particular dietary uh, constraints. The first is with colleges that have taken all the necessary measures to make sure that I'm safe at formals, from the sticky notes to communicating with me in advance, um, to Erdogan House, where I have my um, scholarship for having a total nut ban as well. It's actually the only place in Oxford, apart from the Department of Education, where I'm entirely safe because no nuts are allowed into the building. Um, as well to the various restaurants that have taken the time to help me make sure that I'm safe, that I have options. The managers who have sat down with me and gone through everything, even in restaurants where there are no nuts, they will still go through all of it with you. I understand their liability concerns as well, but it makes a world of difference to know that you are being cared for. Um, because to live without anxiety around food is not something I'm used to. And people will probably find some relatability in this as well. So to be able to go to a place where food is not a specter, but rather an enhancement of life, where it's not a worry that's going to take you through the night, but rather something to look forward to, something that props you up, is a great privilege, and it's probably something we can do more to make that the case in any number of ways. Whether you're, for example, a student who uh, keeps kosher or eats only halal, or you're a student who doesn't drink alcohol or is trying to drink less, or moving towards a culture where we have sensitivity to these things and where food is an enhancement rather than an inhibition, it begins with conversations. So talking to one another, working around the stigma around it, acknowledging the certain cultural barriers and how food is often used as a love language in some, where it can be seen as pressure in others. And if there's anywhere to have those conversations, it's Oxford, because there's quite a number of people here who are experimenting, for example, with various diets, who have taken active steps to form their life around food in a particular kind of way. Um, and so as we move sort of through Trinity term towards the end of the year, as finals add an added layer of complication and stress to life, how can we reflect on those experiences and think about Oxford as a place where socialization doesn't have to have those um, additional stressors as well. And so let me just say thank you again to everyone who's um, supporting me in that, from friends to administrators to colleagues. And thank you to everyone who's listened today. And we're going to have another chaos cut next week, and we'll be back in two weeks' time with a new episode of What's Wrong With You. So thank you so much.